Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to come to my presentation. Um, as you all know, I'm Andrew Pitts, and I am a first-year graduate student from South Dakota State University. Um, I started that while I was out here this spring uh, doing a couple classes from distance, so that was pretty fun. Um, but my project that I got to work on this summer at the Autonomy Incubator was the Hovercraft Swarm Vehicle Testbed. That's the title I'm going with anyway. So the objectives and importance, um, I kind of summed it up, summed all that up into one comprehensively long um, but thorough sentence, and that is a hovercraft vehicle testbed to be designed to support unmanned vehicle swarming research by providing a platform in between wheeled trucks and flying vehicles. And I say that because we have the wheeled trucks that Matt Vaughn has produced and is implementing now, and of course the crazy fly quadcopters that we've um, hopefully all seen. Um, so this third vehicle class will be a bridging vehicle in between those two where it's not quite flying, so we don't have the dangers that maybe come with um, the flying quadcopters, um, but it doesn't have some of the uh, uh, different challenges that the wheeled vehicles would experience. Um, so the, the objectives that were laid out for me with this project were to produce, at the end of the project, a fleet of autonomous vehicles for use with the swarm algorithm projects. Um, I was tasked with trying to compile all the necessary hardware or a list of hardware that we could use for producing these vehicles and in the end uh, delivering a vehicle prototype um, that we could move forward with uh, to produce some hovercraft. All right, so just in some pictures here, I have the progression of how my project went. Um, it started off, I was handed these two guys up here. This is an Inductrix Blade mini quadcopter, and we were turning it into a little tiny Hoover is what they're called, um, but a little hovercraft here. Um, so this is a 3D printed body that Matt Vaughn printed, um, and we're just scavenging the parts from this quadcopter and putting it onto that. So that's what I started off with. Um, and so doing the literature review, um, myself and Brian and Jim, we played around with prototyping a few cardboard constructs of hovercraft to kind of get our own feet wet and understand what a hovercraft actually is and how we could build a few within a day. Um, down here we have the mission planner screen and that's where we pour I ported um, some firmware over to the flight controller, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, to be able to make our craft uh, autonomous. And then in the end over here is using a small race quad with our um, Sparky 2.0 flight controller um, that we've been doing some flight testing with. Um, so during the literature review there's uh, a surprising amount to me of interested research out there um, that's concerned with hovercraft. Um, the picture over here on the left is a project I really found interesting and it's from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And so these vehicles are pretty large. They're, they look like a hockey puck is all, but they're, they're pretty good sized. Um, but they're uh, using four motors to produce uh, thrust and, and sway motions. And then they have one large thruster going downward to produce that hovering effect. Um, and I, I liked that idea because we're using a similar arrangement of motors um, or something that I think we could use for a similar arrangement of motors to do that holonomic motion. Um, but also a lot of projects over here like this one was from a Stanford group. Um, are concerned with water hovercraft, which I don't think will be ours, obviously. Um, but just reading about their different uh, software techniques and everything was really helpful for me to get my feet wet. Um, the actual construction of a hovercraft up here that I was concerned with learning as I have a mechanical background um, is kind of where I started with. So down here they have what's called the plenum chamber, and that's created when the two sides are inflated, usually inflated, um, by that air filling these chambers and creating this pressurized space below um, the vehicle body. And so ours does that by two motors down here producing that hovering thrust into our larger bodied plenum chamber all inside of there underneath the skin of course. Um, so I took some measurements and just tried to design you know what would our vehicle need if it weighed 200 grams and then had these hull lengths and plenum chamber sized and then we came out I came out with a couple of measurements that were more rudimentary um, and, and could be applied later on but just kind of helped again my understanding of the hovercraft vehicle. Um, something I'm a little more familiar with with the other project I work on, the quadcopter inverted pendulum. Uh, this this uh, part of the project was understanding the equations of motion, and that's um, being able to couple the vehicle uh, structure itself with how it's going to be able to move and what kind of movements we can do with our design. Um, so the image up here is the exact uh, same arrangement of how our motors would produce thrust backwards in this motion. Um, so when it's moving outward, that's the uh, surge velocity side to side would be sway and then there's a torque velocity around uh, that middle point as well. 
Um, so I use what's called the Euler-Lagrange method to um, take into account the kinetic energy and potential energy of the system, um, which de is denoted by some of the easy equations down there before uh, lengthening them out. Um, but understanding both of those um, uh, energy sources uh, is really critical to properly model the equations of motion. Um, so stepping onwards then, taking that equation of motion, I began to prototype some uh, rudimentary symbol link flight controllers, get my feet wet with that um, to see what we could port there. Um, so using a couple of sources from that literature review, um, this was my first flight controller and it's an open source controller, so it has no feedback of course from positions or like what, would you, what we would use Vicon for. Um, so here I was using three step inputs into our state space, which we're using the equations of motions there. Um, putting all of that into our state space there and outputting um, position movements and velocity movements as well. And now, so what a closed uh, loop controller is for those that aren't into this field, um, we're taking that feedback back, feedback from those position outputs back over to our inputs in order to tell our controller, you know, if we're telling it to go 10 meters forward in the X direction, um, we're able to feed it back and say, no, you're too off, you know, swaying in, a, in, a, in an irregular motion, let's get back on track. Um, so then we're able to tune this as well with our gain properties um, by coupling that closed loop controller. So I have a couple of animations here from that. Um, and I'm trying to picture it into um, some movements that the hovercraft could do. So this would maybe be a formation flight of a couple of squadrons of hovercraft. Here would be something like the wired maze, perhaps. Um, we're doing some object avoidance or something. And then this one I had just a sign input into our craft. Um, and something, of course, the autonomy incubator is concerned with is doing search and rescue operations. So we have maybe a missing person denoted by that red circle with a perimeter around it um, that once the quadcopter hit that, it stopped. Um, so after working on this a little bit, um, I then worked with Zach Johns and Brian and Jim uh, in it, to work on the actual hardware uh, of implementing our controller. So the controller that was suggested was the Sparky 2.0, and the reason we used it was it is very similar to the Pixhawk, and Pixhawk is used often um, because it's so flexible, and flexible by, by that I mean um, you can use it on uh, a rover, for example, or something driving on the ground. You can use it on a big quadcopter or a forward flying machine. Um, you can use it on a bunch of different vehicle classes. Um, so the Sparky 2.0 does a lot of the same things that the Pixhawk does, as well as it does it as, as at the same rate, let's say, um, by running at the same speed as the Pixhawk. Um, but it's a lot smaller and it weighs a lot less. So that's why it would be des desirable for our craft because we're using such small vehicles as well. It's also really compatible with brush motors, um, and that's what we're taking off of the blade uh, quadcopters. So that was the reason we selected this uh, flight controller. Interestingly enough, it's currently out of sale pretty much everywhere you look. So hopefully in the future, it will be in uh, uh, stores all over so we can get more of them. Um, so in order to use this flight controller, we had to port firmware over to it, and we were going to test it with a quadcopter. Um, so the process that we had to do to accomplish that is going to be denoted by this video. Um, so this web page was actually put up on uh, the Ardu Pilot website because Zach and I asked some of the people um, questions as we were trying to do this process. It took us about four days to accomplish it. And then so after we had gotten ours done, um, they put up this web page in response to our questions. So we felt kind of accomplished getting that out there, I guess, to help other people. It was surprisingly difficult. Um, but here we are at the Ardu Pilot um, website, and we're going to use a quadcopter. So we select the quadcopter class. We go to the correct uh, folders here, all the way down to the newest folder. We go down to the Sparky board here. So they already have firmware created for us. And then we select the correct, um, correct files that we're going to port over. And by porting, I mean we're just shifting it over and um, editing our flight controller to do what we want it to do. Uh, then the, the third step we had to do was use this Betaflight website. Um, but after we had downloaded that firmware from the website, we used uh, the Zadig driver to upload that. And since we'd already done that, ours showed up as Sparky 2. Um, and it denotes that the drivers have been installed once we would do um, install driver. But ours says replace driver since we'd already done it. Um, so what Betaflight does, it allows you to configure and edit your flight controller. Um, up here, I had connected it. We went to Firmware Flasher. Oh, now I'm connecting it. Perfect. And then you would go down here to Upload Firmware and then Install. 
and that's where we've then flashed our board with the appropriate firmware. Okay, so then we come over to Mission Planner now that we have a flight controller that we can use, and we would connect it via USB port to the computer, or we could do it wirelessly if we already had it on the vehicle, but we wanted to test it out. Um, so it comes up with that, oops, my mistake. So once we've connected it, we go up to this corner and we see COM4 appear, and that's how we know our driver's installed, that pops up. So then we hit the connect button, and we'll begin to see that the flight controller is giving us feedback already from the GPS unit. So it'll give us some differences in the HUD there. And of course we get the, the great view of the old AI building um, as we were doing this. All right, so that was then. Uh, we were ready to use our flight controller. We put it onto a small race quad right here, and we did some flight tests. Now, early on, uh, they weren't as successful. Some of that was the additional hardware that we are using, the ESC boards, and so some of them didn't go so well. But other ones did. There was some still, there's, we're still battling vibration issues. Um, so that's, right now, it's torn apart on the workbench downstairs. So hopefully by the end of the week, I can get it flying better um, with the differences that we're making there. But it does fly, just a little unsettled. Um, so the learning outcomes I came to through this project, um, there's a picture of me soldering last night, um, is not only learning how to solder and get better at it, um, but just a wide range of low level to high level learning for myself. Um, I'd never really worked um, to this degree with autonomous systems um, where I was able to touch all parts of the project from hardware to software to um, the many uh, worthy struggles and payoffs that come with all of that. Um, but it was just a very comprehensive learning experience for me, and I was really um, enthused by that, and I gained a lot of confidence. And so the project status uh, currently is that I've conducted the literature review and assembled some uh, good options for hardware and software uh, options going forward. Um, currently, we're designing and implementing that uh, flight controller onto the quadcopter, so we're still in the implementation and design phase. And then hopefully, long term, um, we're able to test multiple of these little hovercraft guys uh, in one comprehensive test. So, and since I made so many animations, I had to make one of the AI. So, but I would like to thank um, Danette especially for giving me the opportunity when I, um, she kind of helped me just, just jump on board since I was already here and that was really awesome for me. Um, Liz Ward is, uh, I guess, another mentor of mine as well, but she's helped me be here last summer. She picked me for the academy team and helped me come back here this spring and summer. Um, and then literally just everyone in the AI, all of you uh, guys and gals, you just helped me so much and it was such a fun environment. So uh, thank you for your time today. And are there any questions? And like why we're using the quadcopter yeah, at all? Like I, yeah, I, the original reason was we knew there's firmware available for quadcopters that we could port and we knew it would be tested and, and usable. Um, so that was one reason. Um, another reason was the Sparky board itself. Um, a reason Zach liked it was that um, he was saying the DARPA Fast Light and Autonomous group. Fast Light uh, Autonomy. Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, they, he has heard from, from somebody he knows there that they really uh, like it and they're trying to use it so um, being able to test it out on a smaller vehicle class was something else that we wanted to do that's why we use the the racing quad frame yeah just to see if we can make it work and then I, I'm sh the reason the vibration is happening I think is just because of the associated um, ESC board that we're using so that's why it's in the shop right now so to speak when Matt originally printed the thing off and just used the same control board from the blade inductrix um, the mixing was off, so it would sway a lot, and you just had to fight that really bad um, yeah. because it was still using the quadcopter firmware. Right. Um, the differences we would make would then just have the two hovering motors just do hover and not like turn on and off as we're trying to sway. Um, so then it's just the two motors in back that are pushing us forward and, and causing right. the rotation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's just an e it was supposed to be an easy, quick test bed to to slap the controller on there and see how well it flies. Okay. So. But if you come up a level, mm -hmm. one of the things 
that we needed to do mm -hmm. was to be able to control these tucker craft, right. right? We didn't have a way to do that already, mm -hmm. so we started looking to find if we could get our Jew copter mm -hmm. right on board. And then right. I'm going to let you say the rest, right? So Wait. these hover vehicles can't carry any payload. Right, right. So... Need a, need, a, need a custom flight board, uh, small enough. That uh, Another good reason is it's just very small and thin. I should have brought it up here. I forgot to bring it up here. But um, it's as small as like a CC3D, just a little square. So fast, light, and agile. So in your uh, closure controller, uh -huh. um, what's your input? Is it velocity or precision? Uh, in, that, in that one, and it was, it was me trying to recreate one from a paper. I'm still trying to make the custom one that I could just do position inputs on. This one was simply putting in um, a step input, and then it was trying to output a sine wave function. That's how I made those, those animations was that. Okay. Um, and it was just trying to connect. It was me trying to see if I did the equations of motion, right. how, they did, uh, how, you know, how it would work out. So if, if I could get the chance to keep working on this, um, that would be the thing I would love to learn more about, is being able to use my controller correctly. So. Okay. And doing all that, just, just making a controller from scratch has been a very daunting but fun challenge. So. Yeah, thank you. Are you also going to be concerned, concerned about the heading, like heading tracking on the vehicle, or Ooh. is this just the position? I would be. I honestly hadn't, hadn't gotten that far. <laughs> but I, yeah, and, that, and that's the kind of stuff I haven't really gotten in touch with the quadcopter Simulink flight controller that I've, I've played with and worked with. Um, that's a good point. So if you had another semester, mm -hmm. Well, what would that semester look like? Where would you be focusing your time, and, and where do you think you would be mm -hmm. at the end? Are you, are you close? I, I would like to see myself um, be able to take, a f if we needed to make a custom flight controller, see if, I, if the one I'm half-built in Simulink would be the one that we'd like to progress forward with, or if we'd like to use something that is uh, in a different language, you know, like in a Python or something like that. Um, however we'd like to arrange it, but being able to take a custom flight controller and actually implement it and see it on a board and working, even if it's not flying that well, just, just working that way. Um, that or if we could just use the, the mixing that we already have with the quadcopter, put it on the vehicle itself, which could happen still this week maybe, fingers crossed, um, and see it working and see how well that could be, and then we could take the next step and see if we needed to iterate more. So that controller is from a paper? The, uh, the the Simulink one, yeah. It, it's it's inspired from a paper. Inspired. Yeah. Do they or do you consider any nonlinear components? They do. Yes. Which ones? I'm just curious. So we'll talk about <laughs> the real tough questions. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's something I'm still trying to learn better. But the Lyapunov method is that uh, familiar to you at all? In, in in making the controls? Okay. That that's the that's the kind of stuff I'm stuck on. I guess with okay. the closed loop uh, mixing. Yeah, and I would love to. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you guys.